Hey, I'm Justin, and I need to find a uniform random point inside of a circle. How do I do that? When I was first looking into this problem, I was working on a coding project that demanded something to be randomly placed inside of a circle, but I quickly fell down a surprisingly deep rabbit hole filled with lots of interesting math, so I decided to compile my findings into this video. I hope you enjoy it. Before thinking about circles, let's simplify the problem and select a random point inside of a square. To do this, just pick a random x and y coordinate within the bounds of the square, and that's it. Now this can also be applied to circles. In some cases, like this one, the point will fall inside of the circle, but not always, which is why we need an extra step. If the selected point falls outside of the circle, try again. And again, until the point falls inside of the circle. This process is an example of rejection sampling, where instead of transforming some distribution, you reject any results that fall outside of your desired range. And it works. However, something that didn't quite sit right with me was knowing that this algorithm might have to be executed multiple times. For simplicity's sake, the radius of our circle will be 1 for the rest of the video, but remember that the math applies for any radius. The probability of a point selected with this algorithm being inside of the circle is equal to the area of the circle divided by the area of the square, or pi over 4, which is approximately 0 0.785, meaning that the chance of the algorithm failing n times is equal to 1 minus pi over 4 raised to the power of n, where n is some positive integer. This number gets really small really quickly as n increases. In fact, the odds of the algorithm failing four times in a row are less than a quarter of a percent. Then we can look at the average number of attempts needed, or the expected value of n, which is the reciprocal of our success rate, or 4 over pi, which is approximately 1.273. So on average, we will only have to make one attempt. All of this math is to say that we really don't have to worry about repeating this process too many times. So let's implement it in Python. First, I use a while true loop to run the code over and over again until a valid point is selected. Then, with random variables x and y between negative 1 and positive 1, I use the Pythagorean theorem to see if the distance from the point to the center is less than the radius of the circle. If it is, then the point is inside of the circle and I can return x, y. If I run this function 3141 times, I know, cute, you'll see that we get our desired result, where the points are randomly yet uniformly distributed around the circle. And we could stop here, but it is possible to select a valid point the first time around, guaranteed. The issue is that we're using the wrong coordinate system. The Cartesian coordinate system that we all know and love limits us by making us select two values that represent distances on perpendicular axes, which we call x and y. What better suits our needs is the polar coordinate system, where points are represented by a distance from a reference point and an angle. For example, consider the point 2 pi over 3. In Cartesian coordinates, this would represent a point at the intersection of x equals 2 and y equals pi over 3. But in polar coordinates, this would represent a point that is 2 units away from the origin at a pi over 3 radians angle. Just by looking at the graphical representations of these coordinate systems, you can probably tell why the polar coordinate system is better for our purposes of working with circles. So all we need to do is select a random radius r between 0 and 1, and a random angle theta between 0 and 2 pi. For drawing purposes, these coordinates have to be converted back into Cartesian coordinates, which can be done by multiplying r by the cosine or sine of theta to get the x and y coordinates respectively. The Python implementation of this algorithm similarly has a random variable theta between 0 and 2 pi, a random variable r between 0 and 1, and returns r times the cosine of theta, r times the sine of theta. If we again run this algorithm 3,141 times, the results should look similar to the rejection sampling algorithm. But they don't. As you can see, the points are much more densely packed in the center of the circle. Let's figure out why that is. We know that there is no problem with how we generate theta because the points are evenly distributed around the circle. So the issue must lie in how we select a value of r. 
The random number generator that we are using has a uniform distribution, meaning that there is an equal probability of each possible radius being chosen. It follows that each ring in the circle will, on average, have the same number of points. Maybe now you can see the problem. As the circumference of a ring grows, the number of points remains constant, resulting in the outer rings with larger radii having lower densities than the inner ones. We can represent how we select a radius or value of r using something called a probability density function, or PDF, which is a function whose integral tells us how likely it is for a continuous random variable x to fall inside of a given interval. Currently, this graph is a horizontal line from 0 to 1 because each value of r is equally likely to be chosen. So we know that this PDF doesn't work, so let's figure out what it should look like such that the points will be uniformly distributed in the circle. Since the circumference of a circle grows linearly with its radius, the number of points should also grow linearly with the radius to keep the density of points in the circle constant. Therefore, our PDF should be a linear function, which we'll denote as f of r equals m times r, where m is some slope. But how do we calculate the value of m? Well, the probability of picking a value of r that is between 0 and 1 is 100%, or 1. Therefore, the integral, or the area under the curve of our PDF, from 0 to 1, must also be 1. From here, you can solve for the height of this triangle and then solve for the slope of its hypotenuse, or you can set up an integral, which is what I'll do. Solving this integral reveals that the slope of our PDF is 2, meaning that its equation is f of r equals 2r. And what's interesting is that every PDF has an integral of 1, so this trick will always work. Now that we know what our distribution should look like, how do we implement it using only our uniform random number generator? We need to find some transformation that, when applied to a uniform distribution, gives us our desired linear distribution. First, let's create a cumulative distribution function, or CDF, which I'll denote as big F of R, and it represents the integral of our PDF, which in our case is R squared. What a CDF actually represents is the probability that a random variable X will be less than or equal to its input. Using this CDF, we can employ a strategy called inverse transform sampling, which takes a uniform distribution, like that of our random number generator, and transforms it. While our random variable x does not have a uniform distribution, the probabilities themselves, marked on the y-axis, do. So let's see what happens if we treat those probabilities as our input, essentially taking the inverse of our CDF. If we take some number of evenly spaced y-values and look at their corresponding x-values, you can see that we get our desired result where the points are more densely packed around greater values of r and more sparse around the lesser ones. And while this intuition is great, I'll show you a more rigorous proof for why plugging a uniform random variable into the inverse of our CDF yields our desired distribution. So far, we know that a CDF represents the probability of a random variable x being less than or equal to its input r. But let's take a look back at what the PDF of a uniform distribution looks like. I'll denote a uniform random variable between 0 and 1 as u. The graph is a horizontal line from 0 to 1 at y equals 1. It follows that the equation of the CDF, the integral of the PDF, would be big F of r equals r. And the definition of a CDF tells us that the probability of u being less than or equal to r is r. If we substitute 0.5 in for r, it makes sense that the probability of a uniform random variable being less than or equal to 0.5 is 0.5, since it is in the middle of 0 and 1. Going back to inverse transform sampling, we can now say that big F of r is equal to the probability of u being less than or equal to big F of r. Then, we can apply the inverse of our CDF to both sides of the inequality, giving us two inequalities that are both less than or equal to r. Therefore, x, the random variable with our desired distribution, is equal to the inverse of our CDF 
being applied to a uniform random variable. And we know that the inverse of our CDF is the square root of r. So let's implement this in Python. The only difference between this function and the last one is that to calculate r, I now take the square root of random. And if we run this 3,141 times, you can see that we once again have points uniformly distributed around the circle. We now have two perfectly valid ways of selecting a uniform random point inside of a circle, but it doesn't stop there. There's another really interesting method that achieves the same exact result. A circle can be thought of as a collection of infinitely many, infinitely thin isosceles triangles rotated about a point. So, if we can pick a random triangle and then pick a random point in that triangle, we will have a uniform random point in the circle. Let's go back to how we can select a random point in a square. This method can be applied to parallelograms as well. Since we are dealing with isosceles triangles, we'll use a rhombus, which we know to be two isosceles triangles joined at the base. Simply pick a random point on two adjacent sides, then, from each point, extend a line that is parallel to an adjacent side and see where they intersect. To constrict our range to just a triangle, we can draw a diagonal and reflect any points in the wrong half of the rhombus over it. Now, let's label the four vertices of the rhombus A, B, C, and D, the two random points on adjacent sides X1 and X2, and the selected point T. Since the triangles are infinitely thin, angle C will approach zero. As this happens, the height of the rhombus will also approach zero, which means that all of its sides will become effectively parallel. Therefore, the distance from the center point C to the selected point T is equal to the sum of x1 and x2. And then we can reflect over the diagonal, which is in the middle of points C and A if we need to. This is ready to be put into Python. First, theta is calculated as usual, but this can also be thought of as selecting a random triangle since they are infinitely thin, so each triangle gets its own angle. Then, x is calculated by doing random plus random, which is just x1 plus x2. If r is greater than or equal to 1, that means the point is on the wrong side of the rhombus, and the value of its reflection is calculated by subtracting r from 2. Finally, the return statement remained unchanged. And once more, we get 3,141 points uniformly distributed around the circle. But a question that I had that you may have as well is why adding two random variables is not equal to multiplying one random variable by two. An easy way to approach this question is by thinking of it in terms of dice. If we take the output of one fair die and multiply it by two, we can see that only even numbers are returned, but also that each output is equally likely to occur. That is, the die has a uniform distribution. However, if we add the results of two fair dice together, you may recall that seven is a more likely output than any other number because there are six different ways for two dice to add up to seven. In contrast, 2 and 12 each only have one way of occurring, making them the least likely outputs. If we graph the frequency of each possible output, we can see that as the sum approaches 7 on either side, which is the average of 2 and 12, the minimum and maximum sums, the frequency increases. So if we imagine reflecting the right half of this graph, the result would look very similar to our desired PDF. But it was at this point that I noticed something strange. Since they both work, both of these methods of calculating r, taking the square root of random, and reflecting random plus random as needed, must have the same distribution, with a linear pdf of 2r and a quadratic cdf of r squared. This doesn't seem right at first glance. How can these two seemingly unrelated and completely different functions have the same distribution? Well, we know that the square root method must have the right distribution, because we derived it directly from our desired CDF. So let's prove the distribution of the sum method. Luckily, the Erwin Hall distribution already exists, which tells us the distribution of the sum of n uniform random numbers between 0 and 1. In our case, n is equal to 2. Here's the equation for the PDF and the CDF. And you could use these, 
but don't worry, we don't actually need to look at them because there's a really elegant geometric derivation of this that works well with lower values of n. To start, it's helpful to plot the two variables x1 and x2 on the x and y axes to better visualize them. A line can be drawn that represents all possible ways by which x1 and x2 can add up to some number t between 0 and 2. So the equation of the line would be x1 plus x2 equals t. The length of this line is proportional to the PDF, increasing from 0 to 1, and decreasing from 1 to 2. The area below the line and within the bounds of this unit square represents the CDF. But remember, any value of t between 1 and 2 is reflected to get the value of r. This means that the CDF can always be represented as the area of a triangle with a base and height of r, which is r squared over 2. But since all the points in this triangle are essentially doubled as a result of the reflection, this area has to be multiplied by 2 to get the desired CDF of r squared. But why stop here? Any function that has this distribution should, in theory, select a value of r that will generate a uniform random point inside of a circle. I'll show you one more method, but I really encourage you to try to find your own, because this is by no means a complete list. This last method selects a value of r by taking the maximum of two random variables. I don't use the max function built into Python because it performs slower than what you see here. So for the final time, 3,141 points are distributed uniformly around the circle. But this still needs to be proven, and it can be done similarly to the Erwin Hall distribution, by plotting x1 and x2 just like before. Since r is equal to their maximum, we can split the square diagonally. Any point that falls in the red half of the square returns x1, because it is greater than x2. Any point that falls in the blue half returns x2 for the opposite reason. Our CDF is represented by the area of a square of side length r in which for every point x1 and x2 are both less than or equal to r. And the area of this square, once again, gives us a CDF of r squared. With these four methods, all that's left to do is to test them and see which runs the fastest. After executing each function 3,141,592 times, yes, I'm sticking with it, these were their times. And the one that is considerably faster than the others is rejection sampling. This makes sense, because the other three methods all have the added expense of performing a sine and cosine operation. So does this mean that most of this work was for nothing? That we should have stopped earlier? I don't believe so, because if it weren't for this problem, I never would have been exposed to PDFs or CDFs or a whole array of interesting geometric proofs. So I'm grateful to this problem for taking me on this mathematical journey, albeit circuitous, and I'm grateful to you for joining me. I hope you enjoyed this video, and have a wonderful day.